Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That's correct, sir. Skynet. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet? This is KFI's TDS. My name is Billy, and I'll be your next control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign, break break, and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? This is a directed net. You cannot transmit without direction from net control. That would be me. And stations are reminded ID at the end of your transmission. This weekly net operates on 146.880 hertz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via echo link are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or echo link node 37247. Topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. www.w5fc.org right now for the complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. Thank you. 
Whiskey 5, bacon, lettuce, tomato, W5BLT, Bill, Garland. This is Kilo 5, Kilo Tango X-Ray Kelly in point. Alright, so for Echo, uh, Echo 
Central Time. All are welcome to check in on any or all of these nets. And as mentioned, after Skynet, it is the Afterglow movie, uh, movie Net, where we discuss the movie, we discuss characterization, plot, special effects, movie scores, or anything related to the film, and then we'll announce the film to watch for the following week. So at this time, I would like to turn the net over to Tom, KE5 ICX, to give us tonight's Afterglow Info. Well, thank you, Billy. This is KE5 and ICX. Tonight's Afterglow movie is... Oh, wait for it. Star Trek II, the wrap-up. You got to say it right. Ah. I'm from 1982. We'll be watching the movie live. from the field day dinner. We do have popcorn, by the way. I saw it coming in through the side door. Popcorn, everyone. Who we'll get to watch two of the greatest over-actors of all time. Siri Judy, William Shatner as James, Captain James Tiberius, Ace Ace in every port of work, and Ricardo, you know that spy in Corinthian leather, Montalban has come! The genetically enhanced and vitamin fortified, high cal, high maintenance, superhuman. In one word, he's super. And in another, he's on. As they face off in the Matara Nebula Galactic Battle of the Ages entitled, Someone Open a Window, the windshield washer fluid as well. Also see Kirk's son strip out third gear while learning to warp drive the Starship Enterprise. Khan easily overcome and strand former original series DX on Sydney Alpha 5, a planet with no water and even low parking. See mind altering space eels reduced Walter Cody's acting ability to that of a cable lamp. It's all here and it's all on our pretty big but super gigantic screen at 10 30 p.m. tonight. Khan! Back to the control.
Saturday night, public observing sessions continue. Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night, so there'd be an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas public observing stations. Now, the star casing is held at Rockwall. Glenn, he is a ham radio operator. I don't know if he's there or maybe he's at field day. I don't know. Is there anybody, uh, ham radio operators, that's at Rockwall that would like to make a report? Come now with your call sign if you'd like to make a report. Well, hearing nothing, I think they're probably busy either checking their radios or looking at the moon rise. The next Texas Astronomical Study of Dallas uh, uh, meeting, I already told you, was June the 28th, and it's just six days. If you'd like more information, go to texasastro.org for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing stations. This is KF5JJ. Clusters D and C, respectively. 
The superstructure is roughly 1 billion light years in diameter and has a total mass approximately 10,000 times the Milky Way galaxy. It contains at least 830 visible galaxies represented in the figure with their respective superclusters, as well as many that are not visible or dark galaxies. The researchers used Minkowski functionals to verify the structure's overall shape and size. The first three quantifying the thickness, width, and length, followed by the fourth determining the structure's overall curvature. The research team compared the luminosities and stellar masses within the superstructure to known high stellar mass galaxies within the SDSS's seventh data release, DR7. This allowed the team to scale the data using known values from local superclusters to determine the overall morphology of the Boss Great Wall. It is currently debated among astronomers if the Boss Great Wall may be considered a structure due to the intricacies of its shape and overall size. whether the supercluster complex is moving together or is being slowly separated by the expanding universe is a key factor to this discussion. Nevertheless, when compared to several other chain structures, such as the Sloan Great Wall, the Boss Great Wall superclusters are far richer, containing more dense, high stellar mass galaxies. The Boss Great Wall's discovery and the data gained therein should prove very beneficial for astronomers who study the overall structure of the cosmic web. So there you have some information about the Boss Great Wall from Wikipedia. This is KFI PDF, Billy, your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet.
you'll need a telescope to observe this event because it happens during the daytime. And those times are for Brookhaven campus of Dallas College. Times will vary across the Metroplex. Slide master, slide number seven. The next, the very next morning on June the 28th, the moon and Neptune are in conjunction in the southeastern morning sky. A telescope is required to observe Neptune. It's too late to see with it or even binoculars. Slide master, slide number eight, please. Later on June the 28th in the evening, that will be in the west northwestern evening sky, Mercury and the bright star Pollux will be in conjunction. Slide master, slide number nine. On July the 1st, the moon and Mars will be in conjunction in the early morning eastern sky. And the next morning after that, on July the 2nd, the moon and Uranus and the Pleiades star clusters will be in conjunction in the early morning eastern sky. Slide master, slide number 11. And the next morning after that, on July the 3rd, the moon and Jupiter will be in conjunction in the early morning eastern sky. Slide master, slide number 12, please. And this is KF5JJ, and this is Skynet. Well, maybe some of you out there in Radio Land have some questions or need to fill in some of the information I've given you. Or maybe you just have a general astronomy question. Come now with your call sign if you have a question or need a fill. Okay, slide master, slide number 13. So is the moon wanes. So do these words for the segment of the sky. Stay safe, keep well, pray for a world. The only one where humans live right now. And until next time, actually I'll be doing another segment on Skynet in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. Really? It's free for the first 5,000 people? Wow. See you net control. This is Steve Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima. In space exploration news, we have a rare sky explosion coming soon. A once in a lifetime event visible to the naked eye. Sometime in the next few months, a spectacle could light up the northern sky. There, in the Corona Borealis constellation, at a distance of more than 2,500 light years, a star called T. Caroni Borealis lurks, building up to an explosion that will temporarily cause the star to become one of the brightest objects in the night sky. Astronomers are on tender hooks, waiting for this thing to blow, not just because it will be amazing, but for the wealth of data that will be, we'll be able to collect on a type of star explosion called a classical nova. The reason we know T. Caroni Borealis, the TCRB for short, is going to explode is because it has done so every, uh, once every 80 years for at least eight centuries. This means that it's very close to a once in a lifetime event and that the technology we have to observe it now vastly outstrips what we had during its last excursion back in February 1946. There are a few recurrent novae with very short cycles, but typically we don't often see a repeated outburst in a human lifetime, and rarely one so relatively close to our own system, says astronomer Rebecca Hounsell of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. It's in, as she quotes, it's incredibly exciting to have this front row seat. Planet-wide storms are driven by seasonal heating 
the uh, Cassini probe reveals like a light bulb switching between high and low power modes. Saturn pumps into space varying amounts of heat based on its seasons. A fresh analysis of data from NASA's Cassini spacecraft reveals. A noticeable effect, effect of, of this flux is turbulence in Saturn's atmosphere, which whips up storms across its north and south hemispheres, strong enough to wrap around the planet. Scientists report in a paper published Tuesday, that was June 18th, in the jur journal Nature Communications. Such as these changes in radiated heat from Saturn and other gas giants are yet to be included in models describing their uh, climates and evolutions, which assume the planets emit heat evenly in all directions and at a steady rate. Lin Ling Lee, a physics professor at the University of Houston, who a decade ago found Saturn does not emit energy evenly and is the co-author of the new study previously told space.com. And remember, NASA's Perseverance rover had a hitchhiking pet rock for uh, over a year. Well, it has lost its pet rock, unfortunately. It's kind of sad. Okay, space birthdays. The Taylor uh, Wong, June 16th, 1940. He flew on STS 51B. Brian Duffy, June 20th, 1953. Flew on STS 45, 57, 72, and 92. James Buckley, or Buckley, June 20th, 1945, flew on STS 51C, 61A, STS 29, and 48. Gary Payton, June 20th, 1948. Flew on STS 51C. This week in space history, June 18th, 1983, when the Space Shuttle Challenger lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center on June 18th, 1983, Sally Ride became the first American woman to fly in space and the third woman overall. She also became the youngest American astronaut in space, although there had been younger cosmonauts. Many of the people attending the launch wore t-shirts bearing the words, Ride Sally Ride, lyrics from Wilson Pickett's song, Mustang Sally. The purpose of this mission was to deploy two communication satellites, an HC2 for Telesat of Canada and Palapa B1 for Indonesia. Both were deployed during the first two days of the mission. And by the way, there will be um, a movie about Sally Ride, and uh, she will be played, I mean, a TV series. She will be portrayed by actress Kristen Stewart. I look forward to that. Valentina Tereshkova became the first one in his face with the launch of Vostok 6. And the date, running back a little. June 16, 1963. She orbited the Earth 48 times and spent three days in space. She is the only woman to have been on a solo mission and is the last surviving Vostok program cosmonaut. She was the youngest woman to fly in space until 2023 when Anastasia Myers flew on Galactic 02 at the age of 18. Since M Myers flew a suborbital mission, Tereshkova remains the youngest woman to fly in Earth's orbit. And that is all I have. Back to net control.
Serving its place in the top list of the Ensemble League Observing uh, Urban Observing Club. Both stars are type B or blue white and not so much color, well, there's not too much color contrast between them. Slide Master, slide number 17, please. Charles Messier's list M4 is a globular cluster and this is a nice object. It's list M5.
call sign. We're having a little interference tonight. Ares 
Block 1 rocket. The 360 watch vehicle is 82 feet tall and is equipped with a 4.9 diameter payload fairing. The rocket is designed to send up to 305 kilograms into low Earth orbit. This is the first mission. It's called the Highly Imaginative Test Flight 1, but does not appear to have a payload on board. Determined will be a launch from uh, Pad 1S of Bostovsky Cosmodrome in Russia. This is the Condor FKA-2. Soyuz rocket will launch the Condor Experimental SAR spacecraft FKA-2 or Condor FKA-2 satellite into a sun synchronous orbit at 510 kilometers altitude and an inclination of 57.4 degrees. The mission is roughly a five-year lifespan. It's being launched on behalf of the NPO Minnesotan. Yeah, you try and say that. Okay, on uh, June 29th, 30th, overnight, will be the launch of the Daiichi 4. This is from the Mission Nobu Launch Complex uh, at JAXA Tagna Beach Ma. Thank you. Somebody knows how to speak Japanese over here and it is correcting my Japanese. I won't say who she is. She might be net control. At any rate, this thing will take off from the JAXA launch site. The third flight of the H3 launch vehicle, the mission H3F3, or flight number three, will launch the Advanced Land Observing Satellite 4, or Daichi 4. Almost four. This Earth observation satellite is manufactured by Mitsubishi, I can say that, Electric Corporation, with its phased array L band synthetic aperture radar, radar or Pulsar 3, and is designed to operate for up to seven years in orbit. In July, we have the Transporter 11 flight from SOC-4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base. The Falcon 9 rocket will launch dozens of satellites into the sun-synchronous orbit of the company's 11th such ride-share mission. Among the payloads are the European Space Agency's Arctic Weather Satellite, UK Space Surrey Satellite, the Taiki Satellite for the UK Space Command, Japan-based IQPS, QPS star number eight satellite, and the ever-popular U.S.-based Planet Labs Tanager One satellite. I don't know what any of these things do, and I'm not sure they do either. Next up, July 7th, 8th, overnight, will be the launch of TurkSat 6A. This will be from SLC-40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The station, the TurkSat 6A communication satellite for Turkish operator TurkSat. The 6A is the first geostationary communication satellite to be built in Turkey with development led by Tupac Space Technologies Research Institute and the Turkish Aerospace Industry. It will monitor the 42 degree east orbital position. That's all I know. And finally, this would not be complete without a super secret mission. So we have the SLC-41 launching USS F-51 on an Atlas V from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The Atlas V rocket designated AV-101 will launch the USS F-51 mission for U.S. Space Force. The mission will launch an undisclosed payload for the military. And uh, Mr. Billy, that's all I have for you. Back to you. This is KE-5 ICX. Number four, Mike Foxtrot, India. Double.
disk that allowed scientists to learn what the chemical composition of the disk was like in its infancy. Previous research used the Atacama large millimeter submillimeter array in Chile and has made many disks around other stars that resemble concentric rings like a dart board. Dart, dart board. The rings of these planetary disks, such as HL Tau, are separated by physical gaps. So this kind of disk could not provide a route to transport these refractory metals from the inner disk to the outer. The new paper holds that our solar system likely didn't have a ring structure in the very beginning. Instead, our planetary disk was a nut and asteroids with metal grains rich in iridium and platinum metals migrated to the outer disk as it rapidly expanded. But that confronted the researchers with another puzzle. After the disk expansion, gravity should have pulled these metals back into the sun. But that did not happen. Once Jupiter formed, it very likely opened a physical gap that trapped the iridium and platinum metals in the outer disk and prevented them from falling into the sun said first author Dong Zhang, a UCLA planetary scientist. These metals were later incorporated into asteroids that formed in the outer disk. This explains why meteorites formed in the outer disk, carbonaceous chondrites and carbonaceous type iron meteorites, have much higher iridium and platinum contents than their inner disk tiers. Zhang and his collaborators previously used iron meteorites to reconstruct how water was distributed in a protoplanetary disk. Iron meteorites are hidden gems. The more we learn about iron meteorites, the more they unravel a mystery of our solar system first, Zhang said. So I got back to that, Daddy D. Follows it out.
Number five, Oscar Thought Shot, Clay, and Sulphur Spring.